My name is Margaret Kelsick. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Michigan's Water Center. And I, um, most of my work involves watershed modeling, looking at the interactions between how we manage the landscape, like farming activities, and water quality downstream. I'm Rebecca Munich. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Water Center at the University of Michigan. And in general, I study watersheds and watershed processes, and the way I study that is through modeling. So trying to understand how we can physically represent the things that are happening in the landscape. We've had to use climate change model information a lot in our work. And that's because in watershed models, one of the main drivers is climate inputs, precipitation and temperature. Um, and those drivers are very important for water quality in a watershed. And so in order to look at the future of a watershed, what the future of Lake Erie might look like depends on what happens in the watershed, but it also depends on the climate information that we're getting from our future climate models. In order to have a really good watershed model for future climate, we need good future climate data. Climate data is collected primarily in weather stations, and there are uh, many different automatic tools to measure a temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, and other um, factors. And those would be measuring at a continuous time scale and then averaging or summing over the course of a day. Looking at really big problems like climate change, its impact on landscape processes and how that affects the lake is a really big challenge in science. We don't currently have models that model the atmosphere, the land, and the lake effectively in one tool. If we did, that would be great, and I hope someday we do. But right now we have a combination of different models and data that may not all be able to really fit well together, um, and we have to try through very various methods and trial and error to figure out what really can we do with this data. And so to really understand future climate um, and its effect in the region, we need to do a really good job of linking and maybe coupling um, these models together so that they can speak the same language, so that their results make sense when you, when you feed one into another, and that we can really see what's going to happen in our region. In modeling the hydrology of a system and then maybe some elements of the water quality, what we first need to do is, is constrain the, the shape of the water body, the lake, the, the rivers, the stream network. So we need to know, you know where the valleys are, where the hills are, how the water drains through the system. Uh, then we need to know how that drainage varies over time. Water can take various pathways. Water can run over the surface. It can infiltrate into the ground. Um, it can stay in the soil or it can infiltrate even further into groundwater. And then it can move within the soil profile. Um, sometimes it can go from the soil into streams um, directly or sometimes it flows over the soil into streams. So when we model things, we have to understand not only how natural systems behave and move water, we have to understand how the things that we have built as humans impact the hydrologic cycle as well. One simple approach to modeling hydrology is called the curve number equation. Um, the curve number of the landscape just has to do with how pervious it is. Um, so concrete is very impervious. That means if water hits concrete, it will run off. Um, something like grass, though, if water falls onto grass, it can infiltrate in. And so a higher curve number means you have a higher potential for runoff. So there's a very simple equation where based on rain and the curve number, you can figure out how much water is going to run off of the landscape. The precipitation is a really important part of the equation for water quality in Lake Erie. So what happens a lot of times is that you might have a really big rain event that happens at a very unfortunate time for farmers. It might have been that they went out and put down fertilizer the day before and then all of a sudden a huge rain event comes and it will wash all of that fertilizer right into the rivers and downstream into Lake Erie. Other things that we can include in the model are chemical behaviors of nutrients, for instance. So um, what happens uh, to phosphorus and nitrogen um, within the soil? So um, they can get taken up by plants, they can uh, transform to, from organic to inorganic forms. Um, and so 
understanding how these things happen within the landscape is, is part of what I do, um, but also using the knowledge that others have built over time in these models to predict what may happen in the future or to help us identify specific solutions that may help with problems like the phosphorus loads in Lake Erie. And sometimes you're trying to simulate uh, actual conditions. Uh, in other cases, you're trying to figure out you're kind of doing uh, computer-based experiments to understand how the system works better. So you may be turning different things off or turning things on, uh, increasing the flow, decreasing the flow, increasing the concentration or, of something, just to see how sensitive the system is to all its different components. Uh, so it, it's a way of kind of taking the complex natural world and putting it into a, you know, a laboratory, in this case a, a computer-based laboratory, but still a, a system where you can perform more controlled experiments than you can uh, just out in the wild. I talked about models and that's, that's a very effective way to, to kind of compare lots of different control parameters. Another way to do it is actually in the laboratory where you could take a water sample that contains some type of algal bloom cells and then add different types of nutrients and different ratios, different concentrations to see whether that causes those cells to multiply more quickly or to grow larger or to change their buoyancy or uh, the various things that that might cause. This is where I think the models can actually be really useful. In the real world, right, all we have is the data to look at in history over time. The one thing that the models allow us to do is they allow us to test different scenarios. What would happen if the precipitation changes by 20% and we see more intense precipitation events? Um, how would that affect the nutrient runoff? And if we have that kind of change in precipitation um, and we can test different management strategies with the models as well. So we can run scenarios where we say, we think this best management practice may uh, help reduce phosphorus loads, and we can implement it in our models and then look at the change in loads and see if it does help or if it maybe worsens the problem. The systems are complex enough that no one scientist can really be an expert in all of those different areas. So there's a lot of uh, working together, a lot of collaboration with other scientists. So you get an algae expert together with a with a crop expert and a, and a water, uh, a river expert. And between them, they, they uh, can explain what they understand well and what they don't understand.